Humphrey and Alexander's troops. Alexander's a smart tactician. He knew that if you offer a cavalry-heavy force open ground, that cavalry will charge across that open ground. It was a given in Alexander's mind that if he offered that open ground, Darius would take advantage of it. And he was right. Darius orders his cavalry to charge the Macedonian left. The Macedonian left flank is under the command of Parmenio. He awaits the charge, knowing that his task is to keep the Persian line engaged. And on the other side of the Macedonian line, the young king does something completely unexpected. He turns his cavalry to the right. In an unexpected move, particularly unexpected to King Darius, Alexander begins to ride parallel to the line of battle. A curious move in the eyes of Darius, who's concerned that Alexander might ride off of the prepared battlefield at Gaugamela. Or, more likely, Alexander might outflank him, might be able to turn to the left and ride down his flank thus carving him up in detail. So Darius can't tolerate this. He sends signals to his cousin Bessus, commander of the Bactrian cavalry, the heavy cavalry, on the Persian left. He says, stop that. Bessus makes his move with his cavalry. They begin to ride parallel with Alexander. This unorthodox tactic is unsettling to Darius, but he has little time to be concerned. For in the center of the battlefield, the unbreakable phalanx of Alexander's army is about to clash with the elite guard of the Persian force. And now, two empires, two continents, and two armies meet head-on with the fate of the world in the balance. The battle has begun. October 1st, 331 BC, the outnumbered army of Alexander the Great is about to collide with the army of the Persian King Darius. The battle is underway. As the center and right clash, Alexander and his companion cavalry continue to ride to the right, while the Persian cavalry matches their every move. But Alexander has a hidden advantage. Running on foot between the horses of the cavalry is a complete regiment of peltists, Alexander's light infantry. Peltists were the skirmishers who were seen all around the battlefield, in and out, uh, with lots of a variety of weapons. And when they hit you with stuff, they pelt you. So we still use that word today, from the peltists, lobbing you with sticks and stones. Now they used several weapons, these peltists. They used short bows, short range arrows. They used javelins. They'd have a weapon much like this, a light, very aerodynamic spear. Not designed so much for range, but designed for velocity. From that, we get this sort of thing, Charles, thank you. This is the modern scholastic competition, Olympic style competition, javelin. Thing to remember is, from that came this. How effective are they? Let's see. So javelins were used by peltas, by skirmishers, out in front of the battle line to pick off high-value targets, those officers, those chariot crews, and to keep the enemy on edge, unbalanced. One of the other weapons that they used was really quite common to the era. It was called the sling. They might look something like this. A very simple piece of gear. A leather pouch sewn 
so as to give it a pocket to contain the missile or the rock, and two plated or braided lengths which would serve to launch the missile. Now, that stone may not look like it have injured anyone downrange, but imagine this. Two or three hundred peltists, all armed with these slings, all throwing metal objects or rocks into the enemy line of battle. Somebody's going to get hurt, or more importantly, somebody's going to get rattled. With the peltists hidden from the Persians, Alexander moves steadily across the battlefield. The hidden peltists will be one of the keys to Alexander's strategy to win the battle. As Alexander rides, the front line of the Persian army begins to feel the full power of the Macedonian phalanx. Seeing his elite troops pushed back, Darius decides to deploy his most feared weapon, the scythed chariot. A scythe chariot was basically a two-wheeled chariot with scythes, so blades attached to the wheels, so they stuck out horizontally, so they would cut down people who they hit. Two hundred scythe chariots, the supreme weapon of the Persian army, burst forth from Darius's front line. Most opposing commanders might have seen only two defenses against this onslaught. Either stand their ground or retreat before the giant blades and regroup later. But Alexander had devised a brilliant tactic to defeat them. Darius launches his chariots. Alexander knew it was coming. And he had taught his men to trap the chariots. It's a simple move that is still analyzed in tactical studies today. A move that is called the mouse trap. No horse is going to come toward a bristling line of men with sharp pointy sticks. So if you open a space, that horse will come into that space. He will be trapped. You can gut the horses, you can pull the charioteers down and kill them. And that's what he did. In a sort of tactical judo, the Macedonians use the chariot's own momentum against them. Within minutes, the threat from the Persian chariots is neutralized. The chariot will never be used again as a significant weapon of war. As the battle rages on, Parmenio's left flank is under heavy attack and is near collapse. On the other side of the battlefield, Alexander continues to ride away from the fight. But why? The Battle of Gaugamela has reached a critical juncture. The Macedonian phalanx are engaged on the front line, while Alexander continues to ride across the battlefield on the Macedonian right. And on the Macedonian left flank, Parmenio is in trouble. His outnumbered troops are on the verge of collapse. He attempts to contact Alexander, asking for reinforcements, but his message does not get through. Battlefield communication in ancient warfare was primitive at best. They had trumpeters who would play a certain set of notes, and you would hear those set of notes and recognize it as a signal for your unit. And then the second set of notes that they would play would be what your unit is to do. You had drums whose beat could change, which would tell you that you need to increase the pace, or you need to turn left, or you need to turn right. It was very difficult, and it was probably very, very confusing. The fog of war and the rattle of battle was a literal problem in those days. Communication was tough. While Parmenio struggles, Alexander and his cavalry continue to ride to the right, neither charging nor retreating. Darius's cavalry keeps pace to prevent the Macedonians from attacking his flank. Alexander angled his force farther and farther and farther off of the killing zone, and he actually went kind of out of the whole prepared field that Darius had set up for him, making Darius pull cavalry out of his line to keep from being outflanked. And as Darius pulled that cavalry out of his line, the line thinned out in the middle. And as that happens, 
the center of the Persian line cannot shift.